Today's episode is going to knock your socks off. My guest is Dr. Artavan Asley. He's a board certified spine surgeon. Um, and we're talking about his book, Corporate Spine, how spine surgery went off track and how we put it right. He is so honest. He is so dedicated. I so admire his passion and his willingness to speak up about things that people don't want to talk about. You guys are going to love this episode. I can't wait to, for you to get into it. Um, little background on him. He got his undergrad at the University of California, Berkeley, where he double majored in physiology and genetics. And then he earned his MD from New York Medical College and completed his residency at St. Vincent's Hospital in New York City. Um, he received his spine surgery fellowship training at Harvard University, um, has been in private practice for quite a while now. Um, he's out in Sa Sacramento, been doing this for 20 years. And he's talking about how we got a little off track on the spine surgery thing. <laughs> and he's just so, he was just, he, I, you, you, you'll you see why I love him so much once we get into it. He's just like, I have questions and they're not being answered. And why are we regurgitating stuff? And what do people actually need to know? There are so many people with back pain. Um, I think he says that on, on the book, there's 16 million people estimated. Let's see. Well, with Back, hold on. Each year, an estimated half million people in the U.S. alone will undergo undergo spinal fusion surgery. And then I think the stat I read somewhere, so I'm going off the top of my head, was like something like 16 million people they estimate are dealing with back pain at a significant level. And so this book is really cool because it goes into what you need to know if spine surgery is something that you've either had or you are considering. And he's also talking about how some of the approaches they do in are not very effective. And um, it is just such an incredible episode. I hope you guys enjoy. Here is Dr. Asley. Dr. Asley, I was so excited when I saw the name of your book, Corporate Spine. I was just telling you before we started that I have seen back surgery, like literally ruin people's lives. <laughs> they end up on all these medications. They have all these problems. And I obviously not a surgeon. I'm not educated on it, you know, but I've, I've kind of developed this like, oh my gosh, are you sure that is the only thing that they can do because holy crap. And so can you fill us in? I mean, obviously this is what, you know, this is your whole world and you, I love that you're questioning how things are being done and how can we do them better? But can you tell us like this, I don't know, the state of the, of spine surgery from your opinion and why you've, you know, decided to write this book and do things a little bit differently. Sure. Uh, first I would like to thank you for inviting me. This is a, a great opportunity and I'm very excited to be here and talk about the state of spine surgery currently, which is horrible. <laughs> I just want to say that from the beginning and, uh, you know, um, where do I start? When I uh, started my practice, first thing I got I got to talk about my background. I went to Berkeley. I double majored, went to medical school in New York Medical College. Then I did my residency in orthopedic surgery because there are two ways of becoming a spine surgeon: one through orthopedic surgery, the other one is through neurosurgery or brain surgery. Uh -huh. uh, I would say I don't know the statistic exactly. I would say it's pretty much half and half. Half of the spine surgeons have neurosurgery training. Half of them have orthopedic surgery training, which is very, very important for my um, uh, for my topic and my book, which I'll explain why. Um, so after uh, finishing residency in orthopedic surgery, I did a year uh, fellowship in spine surgery in Boston. And in 2002, I moved to California. Actually, I'm from California. I went to Berkeley undergrad. So came back to California. Now, the first... 10 years of my practice, I practiced exactly how I was trained and I did exactly what they said, just like a machine, you know, just mm -hmm. like a um, conveyor belt. You know, you mm -hmm. just go through and uh, repeat those things. Well, it turns out that uh, I actually, uh, you know, sometimes you question your decisions initially, but then it turns out it was the best decision you ever mm -hmm. made. I started my practice in a small town north of Sacramento called Yuba City. Um, a lot of doctors might find that not very prestigious. You know, everybody looks to go into big cities, universities to have the prestige of that practice and a background. You know, you're much more uh, valued if you uh -huh. are in a big town. Well, I got to tell you that practicing in a small town was absolutely quintessential for mm -hmm. development uh, as a spine surgeon. And why? Because 
when I do, did my surgeries, my patients, I can see them in town. I will bump into them. Uh, one of some of my patients' right. cousins is a friend or a neighbor, right. or my office manager. So everywhere I went, I saw my patients. So I kind of mm-hmm. knew how my patients were doing, which mm-hmm. you're not going to get that in a Huge. big town. Right. So as I was doing that, the second, so I've been in practice for 20 years. This beginning of my, the, the 10th year or like the second half of my practice, I started asking questions. I started saying like, wait a minute, what are we doing here? Mm-hmm. Uh, why are we doing it? Can we do better? So I started asking questions. The way it started uh, was that um, we knew what, well, let's go back. So what is spine surgery? Uh, We do spine surgery when non-operative care fails. Um, I always tell my patients treatment of back pain and neck pain falls into three stages. The first stage is what we call manipulative treatments. The whole idea is to manipulate your body, the patient's body, try to get them better. In Mm -hmm. that category, you have chiropractic care, physical therapy, acupuncture, massage, Mm -hmm. you name it. Um, And then that's the first stage. Second stage are therapeutic injections. And most of them are steroid injections. And then last and third step is surgery. I always tell my patients, as a surgeon, my job is to avoid surgery. My job is to do whatever I can for the patient not to end up in surgery. Mm-hmm. However, if if the if the uh, for for patient to become a surgical candidate, two things needs to happen. One, a patient that has had everything and has determined that actually their pain is not tolerable. That means that they mm-hmm. cannot continue like this. Mm-hmm. Two, a spine surgeon got to uh, identify a problem on the MRIs that he believes is causing the problem, therefore fixing it will result in pain going away. So those mm-hmm. things needs to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, what I, once I started my practice, um, I started asking questions. And then not only that, I started getting approached by uh, chiropractors, uh, health care providers that are the initial, uh, like a physical therapist or so. Mm-hmm. Uh, my training was that, oh, these stuff don't work. Surgery is the only thing that works, literally. I mean, I'm not kidding you. So me being a very open-minded guy, I started asking questions. Well, well, let me figure out what these guys are doing. Mm -hmm. So once I did that, my jaw dropped. I mean, I remember for a while, I was like, oh, my God, what a fool I was. And And this is how it goes. And this is one of the things I talk about in my book. Never ask a specialist what they think of other specialties i mean just be careful when you ask like why because all day they see people who had the other sort of treatments and they didn't get better because if they did get better they're not going to come and see you yeah so so that was a time like oh my god that's what's happening well spine surgeons especially the guys who practice in a university referral you know when you're in a university referral center you see all the worst of the worst people have had everything bad surgeries mm-hmm. you know bad fractures just just bad stuff the most complex stuff mm-hmm. so all day you see people who had those treatments especially chiropractic and they didn't get better because if they got better they're not going to come and see you right simple as that and it right. took me five years to understand that so mm-hmm. once i started having a relationship with chiropractors then actually i started learning from them yeah then awesome. then yeah, then my practice actually changed. Mm-hmm. See, my practice changed from just doing surgery to doing the injection, actually do some therapies as well. I did want some therapies in my office actually till the COVID happened and then we stopped. But mm-hmm. so I am kind of a I'm different type of a sp- uh, spine surgeon. Um, mm-hmm. I am more in tune with non-operative care because I knew if I wanted to find out where the pain is coming from, what we're doing, what is the what is the a key uh, or understanding of the back pain? I cannot be the last guy that uh, see the patient. I got to be one of the you know middle or at least beginning guy oh. of the guy when we see the patient and treat them basically. Mm. So, um, so anyway, so as I was saying is that spine surgery. Oh, the other thing I I I, I'm, I know I'm jumping from no from yeah keep to jumping <laughs> right okay very good. <laughs> One thing, one important thing I want my patients to understand is that 
spine surgery is a very young field. And I'll mm-hmm. explain to you. It wasn't really till, I mean, some people were, may argue saying that, well, we've been doing spine surgeries till like turn of the century, like 1900s. But, but we really couldn't see the discs. You know, spine is a bunch of bones that are stacked up on top of each other, separated by these cushions. We call them discs, and they can injure and then cause pain. So we couldn't really see these till invention of MRI. Well, the first commercially available MRI was like 85 or so. Well, when the, something becomes available, it doesn't get spread out throughout the country. Uh, so it takes 10 years for other you know, institutions yeah. to have it. Not only that, the first MRIs were not good quality. So I'm talking about somewhere in mid-90s that we started getting good MRIs that we can see these discs and see what's happening. So, well, that doesn't leave us much, much time. Yeah. <laughs> this is just like yeah. 1995 till now, you know, we're just right. kind of a understanding to crack the code, kind of see what is going on. That's mm-hmm. one thing. So um, it all started from my research. When I was uh, about, you know, 2013, 2014, I started getting heavily involved with research and development. I invented a device, which I will explain. And my device actually won the innovation showcase in Congress of Neurological Surgeons in 2015. Uh, That means that my uh, people who were in charge of Congress of Neurological Surgeons, they thought that my invention was important enough to be presented to the rest of the society. And uh, and this is all, this is how it started. When we do spine surgery, one of the common surgeries that we do to treat neck and, neck and back pain, we do a few a surgery called fusion surgery. In this surgery, uh, the disc, the cushion between the two bones have worn, have been damaged. Uh, you can see that on the MRI that the disc has damage on it. And then uh, you try non-operative, well, when they, don't get better and the patient decides to proceed with surgery, then we do the surgery called fusion. And the fusion is a surgery that you go in, you open the back, you put bone graft, uh, bone chips between the two vertebrae and hoping that these bone chips will turn into a solid bone. And then the two bones, two vertebrae fuse to each other, eliminating motion that are banging that disc and causing pain, eliminating motion and therefore eliminating pain. So we started doing those surgeries around, let's say, 1970s, 1960s, 70s, and 80s. Well, this surgery worked pretty well, except when you do that, when you put the bone chips between the two bones, what's going to happen is that a percentage of people are not going to heal. So you put the graft, bone graft, hoping that it becomes a solid bone, but in about quarter, so one out of four patients, that didn't happen, and which is part of patient's biology. So that ended up in what we call non-union, which is a very painful. So you mm-hmm. think that the, the original problem is bad. Mm-hmm. If you do surgery and you end up in a non-union, your pain is going to be 10 times worse. Wow. So right around that time, right around 80s or so, we were trying to figure out how we can increase this percentage from 75 to hopefully 100 or mm-hmm. better. Well, being a subspecialty of orthopedic surgery, we had learned in general orthopedic surgery in fracture fixation that the best way to heal the two bones together is to immobilize them, to hold them together in a rigid fashion so the bones can heal together, basically. Mm. We learned that from fracture. Uh, a group, a Swiss German group in 1960s, they used plates and screws to insert into the fractured bone like a femur or, mm. or humerus. And uh, so this surgery worked beautifully. Um, you didn't have to put the patient in the cast. Uh, bone healed very well. So we learned in orthopedic surgery that the key for the fusion is immobilization. Well, right around 1985, uh, two surgeons from France, uh, they figured out to put a very large screw, the screw that I'm holding. It's a very large, thick screw that gets inserted into the vertebrae from back to front. There are two columns of bone we call the pedicle that connects the back part of the vertebrae to the front part of the vertebrae. So you put a screw through the middle of this column uh, from the back into the front, into the vertebral body, 
And uh, we call these pedicle screws. And every screw on the back, they have a tulip that can accept a rod. So if you want to fuse, let's say, three bones together, you would put three screws on each side. And mm. then you put a rod between these tulips and you tighten them. And that way you mm. immobilize these bones together. Hopefully they'll fuse together. So when in 1985, the American surgeons saw this, they were like, wow, that's what, a, what we've been waiting for. This is exactly in tune with mm-hmm. what we learned from orthopedic surgery. So the use of these screws became standard of care. Mm-hmm. Well, there were some problems. Initially, the results were not good. Uh, there were two companies that were manufacturing uh, these screws, and one of them went out of business because of the lawsuits. The other one, which is a major company now, they call Medtronic, um, was being sued 7,000. There were 7,000 lawsuits at that time against Medtronic. Lawyers not only sued the manufacturer, but they sued the doctors too. So there were about 500 lawsuits right around 1993, 1994 Mm -hmm. against North American Spine Society and American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. What happens is that in the middle of all of this, one paper came out by a doctor named Dr. Zdeblik. He's the chairman of uh, spine surgery in University of Wisconsin right now, as, as, as we speak. So he published a paper in 1993 that said these screws work beautifully. They are absolutely perfect. Everybody, so what they did is this. They had uh, half of the patients did not get screws. Half of the patient got screws. Well, it turned out the, the half that received the screws, they did far better. They had a far better pain relief. They have a far better rate of going back to work. And it said, these are beautiful. So Mm -hmm. that paper gave the green light for spine surgeons to start using these screws. And from that point on, every fusion surgery that we had, we used these screws as an immobilization and became a standard of care. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now this is the problem. Vertebral body, the vertebral bone, is not a solid block of wood. It's not a solid block of bone. It's not like a cement block. Mm-hmm. It's like a it's like a shoebox. It's like a cinder block. The outside bone is cortical bone. We call it a solid cortical bone. The inside bone is a spongy bone we call cancellous bone. Well, what happens is that when you're young, it works great. But when you get older, especially above 65, 70, the spongy bone in the middle gets really weak. Mm. So we started seeing, especially with aging population, we start seeing problems uh, with, the, with our surgeries. These screws start pulling out, mm. things start falling apart, patient required extension of the fusion, keep going up and up and up, wow. uh, repeated surgeries. And we know that very well. That Mm -hmm. is a big, huge problem right now in the world of spine surgery. Mm -hmm. Well, here comes me around 2013, 2014. Um, I looked at this problem. I said, okay, I'm going to invent a device to help the elderly patients. Mm -hmm. So I did invent a device. And that device was a flat plate that sits against the lamina. So lamina is this flat bone in the back of the vertebrae, that's the roof of the spinal canal right here. That's the lamina. And it's a cortical bone. It's one of the strongest bones actually in the body. So I said, well, we have to take advantage of that. So actually I have a model of my device. So this is the device that I invented. Uh, It's a flat plate that sits against the lamina and uses composite straps to wrap around the lamina. And there is a clamp that's built into the base of this tulip that goes through and as it gets tensioned like a zip tie, there is a screw in the middle of the tulip that you turn and the clamp clamps the strap. Therefore, this device immobilizes the spine without penetrating it and uses a cortical bone for it. Mm. So as I said, my invention won the innovation showcase. And then I started having some problems with it. I started trying to solve those problems. When I started solving the problems, I said, well, let me go look at the literature, spine literature, see what do we have for the screw, see if the screws have the same problem or not. How do we deal with that in terms of the screws? And that's what I found out was 
absolutely disastrous. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was just one thing led to another, led to another, led to another. Mm-hmm. And as I was figuring these things out, just when I thought that things cannot get worse, it got 10 times worse. Wow. And this is how it goes. When I looked at the literature, I found Dr. Zdeblik's paper in 1993. Well, it turned out that it's the only paper. That paper was the only paper that said these screws work beautifully. I found six multi-center, multinational, multi-author papers that was published in our journal. So it's not like they published some other, you know, some Mm -hmm. uh, place that, you know, we don't know. No, it was in our spine journal. Some of them won awards Mm -hmm. uh, that they said these screws do not work. They do not increase fusion rate and they do not improve outcome. Wow. So I was like, wait, what is going on here? <laughs> yeah. uh, wait, uh, you know, and, 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 the, and the interesting thing, thing is that the leaders of the field are well aware of these papers. It's not like they don't know about it or nobody mentions them. No, they know. But I'm going to bring the argument about this later. So I said, wait a minute. Let's look at this paper in 1993. Let's just study that a little bit more, see what was going on. The first thing that I saw, it was just, I I don't know how to describe it. I I was just shocked. That paper was published in 1993 by Dr. Zedeblik as a preliminary report. I spent about two years looking for the final report or the follow-up report, and I couldn't find it. One day I was in a conference and I was talking to one of the surgeons, uh, established surgeon from um, one of the Midwestern uh, universities. And he said, oh, yeah, that study was never finished. That's all we have. That study was abandoned in the middle. I was like, what? <laughs> if, you, if you Google that study, Zedeblik spine fusion right now, that study will come out and you will see that's been referenced in 1,106 articles as of today. This wow. paper was the most referenced paper in the entire world of spine surgery, wow. an unfinished preliminary report. Wow. So I was like, wait, that's bad. Let's do a little <laughs> bit more research. Wait, you think that's bad? So as I said, once in 1993, this paper got published, by 1996, those seven laws, 7,000 lawsuits that I told you, they started fading out. They started dropping out for lack of evidence and mostly because of this paper. Well, guess what? Right around 1996, Dr. Zdeblik started getting paid from the manufacturing company, Medtronic. Wow. And by, wait, it gets far worse. <laughs> I swear to God, just when I thought it's like, this is bad, it gets like, like, how, where is it going to go? Wow. So by 2004, he got paid $34 million, allegedly for something he invented. I've seen his inventions. And anyways, let's not talk about that. So by 2004, he got paid $34 million, starting when the lawsuits were disappearing. Then, then it gets 10 times worse. So by 2004, 2005, the same company, Medtronic, put him in charge of another important study. This study was about a product called BMP, bone morphogenic protein. It's a bone graft substitute. Uh, Remember in the beginning of uh, um, of our talk, I said that you got to get the bone chips and put it Mm -hmm. between the two vertebrae. Well, the bone chips got to come some. Uh, When we harvest those bone chips from a donor site well the donor site becomes a problem so Mm -hmm. uh, we wanted to get bones from some so this uh product bmp is a hormone that we all have it when you fracture when you break your bone gets excreted and that's how you heal your bone Mm -hmm. well uh, scientists have identified that and it comes as a product so Mm -hmm. listen to this so medtronic put dr zdebley in charge of that study well, in 2005, he published a couple of papers. This time he got caught falsifying his results. Wow. wow. Wait, you think that's bad? We think that's bad. No, it gets 10 times worse. Then there was an investigation by United States Senate. So this is not some investigative reporter. This is United States Senate concluded 
that that paper that this, Dr. Zdeblik published in 2005 was not written by him, was written by the company. Wow. Is that, is that crazy? Wow. It, it's just, it, it just blows my mind. So, and then not only that, Dr. Zdeblik was the main editor of a major spine journal from 2002 to 2018. And, and I tell my friend, they say, never in history of medicine, a company has had such a direct access right. in, to the literature. I mean, yeah. it's just, it's just yeah. so anyways, so this is what happened. I had to answer this question. I was like, this is, I, I got to figure this out. I spent three years, three years to answer this question. What is going on? And I talked to, so in these three years, I talked to professors. I ambushed them. I, uh, I chased them. I you know, some, some of them were really nasty to me. Some of them was like, you know, just get away from me, that kind of a thing. Mm-hmm. And Allah was asking them to just listen to me for five minutes. You know, uh, this was their answer. Their answer was that, yes, we know that so far we haven't been able to show that these screws work with research. But we know that they work and we will show them the future. Mm. And my response to them was like, every time you fail to show that something works, you've just shown that it didn't work. These are not two separate events. So you can't just keep on going waiting for that one paper that's going to, not only that, to make things worse, there was another paper came out in 2018. This was a paper that did, uh, they had done research over eight years, looking at the patients very closely. So the paper even in 2018 said that addition of these screws do not change anything. Wow. And then, uh, and it's not just me saying this stuff. In 2020, I walked up to my office and I picked up a, a spine journal. You know, I'm, I'm, uh, I have a subscription for it. This journal, the lead article, this is what the lead article said word for word. Undisclosed conflict of interest is prevalent in spine literature. Undisclosed conflict of interest is prevalent in spine literature. What is it saying? Our our own journal is telling us that our literature is tainted. Yeah. I mean, it's just crazy. So anyway, so after three years, I think I found the answer, what is going on. And this is how it goes. We, and this goes back to our training. We train, after medical school, we train for five years to become orthopedic surgeons. In that, in that five years, they imprint, they, they put into our head that the key for any bone healing is a screw. I mean, we just, we use screw, screws in different directions, different type of screws and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So it's a fracture. So in that five years, I cannot say anything about neurosurgery part, but in that five years, our exposure to spine surgery is very limited. Any mm-hmm. orthopedic surgeon will tell you that. Mm-hmm. Then after that, you do one year, only one year of spine surgery, and then you become a spine surgeon and start practicing as a spine surgeon. So what happens is this. We learn what we learn from orthopedic surgery, and we apply that into spine surgery. Mm. Now I'm realizing that we should have never done that. Spine was never meant to be a subspecialty of orthopedic surgery. There is nothing, and I mean nothing in orthopedic surgery, that's going to make you a better spine surgeon. Spine surgeon is a completely different world by itself. Wow. Wow. And that's, we have to study, learn, and apply those principles to spinal fusions. I'll give you an example. And it's very simple to understand. I say this to 14-year-old, they understand it. But when I say this to other spine surgeons, they're like, uh-huh, 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 uh-huh. No. Mm-hmm. I'm like, why? I mean, I, I just wow. don't think it's, 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 it's beyond comprehension. Let me explain to you. The concept that we work with as an orthopedic surgeon, the concept of rigid fixation, that concept works in extremity for one important reason. If there's a construct that's not very strong, we can eliminate gravity 
So let's say you did a surgery in the leg and you're like, mm, I'm not so sure about this. You put the patient on a non-weight bear. So you put them on crutches so they can't put pressure mm -hmm. on it, basically. Mm -hmm. Well, you can't eliminate gravity in the spine. You cannot, you cannot yeah. just uh, levitate a patient, you know, <laughs> suspend them in the air for three months at a time. <laughs> so that means that the second the patient gets up, that screws and rods are in constant stress. Yeah. So the concept of rigid fixation does, doesn't work in spine. We have to have a new type of fixation that I call it reactive rigid fixation. Mm -hmm. It's not flexible. It's still rigid, but it can give, it can bend and it can dissipate the energy as opposed to cut out and fall out and everything fall right. apart basically this is no different than building buildings in an earthquake zone you know in right. san francisco for example we don't make the buildings stiff we put right. it on rollers we put it on this thing so when there's an earthquake it can actually swing and dissipate that energy right. as opposed to falling apart and just you know just basically the whole thing fall down basically right right mm -hmm. does that make sense i mean 100 percent. and right. the, you're working with a, a human biology in which we move and twist and do all these things like it only makes sense that especially when something's trying to heal if you've got it super incredibly rigid and it hasn't healed yet and you're in this twisty organic body <laughs> it's not right. going to work <laughs> exactly and and some of the things that really we never sat down and try to study these. Even in the screw, there is a phenomenal, I call it the um, Wolverine phenomena, which yeah, nobody even talks about, about it. it. Yeah, I mean, nobody talks about that. I discovered it because I was developing that device. Uh, what happens is that when you put these screws in, there's no way that you can put all the screws in one straight line. So they're gonna be off center. They're gonna be right, left, up, down or so. So when you put that rod in and you tighten it, those screws fight each other. Mm. So sometimes when the patient's, uh, you know, bone's not strong, let's say 60 years old or so, um, you lose by just putting the rod, connecting with the rod, you lose about up to 40% of your, of your um, fixation. And nobody talks about that. It's just, it's just crazy. Yeah. So that's where we are. Now, why did I write this book? I tried my best. I am not the kind of guy to just be a, what they call the uh, keyboard warrior. Just, yeah. you know, thing. no, I'm in the trade just fighting the fight for patients. Yeah. You know, I go to these conferences, I get up, I bring up these issues. I, uh, I present the papers uh, and get nowhere. If you want to hear a funny story, yeah. uh, I'll tell you a story to, for you to realize what I'm up against. Mm. So in 2016, in North American Spine Society, NAS, I got up. Now you got to understand at that time, my knowledge wasn't what it is now. I was just starting to figure it and starting to ask questions. So I got up in front of like thousand spine surgeons and I said, well, uh, most of the papers saying that these screws don't work. You know, there's six papers says doesn't work. What is going on? And, you know, somebody at the panel that were up front, they said, well, we did our studies and then we realized that they uh, they do work. I didn't want to get in a fight, you know, because yeah. every time you talk about the screws, a fight. So right. I didn't say, well, why didn't you publish that? You know, mm -hmm. um, so I, I went for, you know, a cup of coffee. There was a break. I was standing for a cup of coffee and there was a, a instrument rep. Next to me, I was talking to him, and there was a very established older surgeon behind me. Uh, the instrument introduced me to the surgeon behind me, and uh, he turned around and told him that Dr. Asley doesn't like the screws. So the surgeon behind me said, oh, you're the gentleman that made that comment about the screws. Well, I just want to tell you that everybody's welcome to their opinion, but you're very wrong. I said, it's not about me. Yeah. It's about the research. If the research says that the stuff doesn't work, maybe, just maybe they're trying to tell us something. He said, I know, I published those papers. Those are my patients. Those are my papers. I'm like, yeah, what's your name? He told me his name. Of course, I won't mention it. And yes, he's well known. 
and I had the papers in my hand. I said, let's find your paper. So it was the second paper in my hand. He said, see, that's my name. It was the fifth author. See, that's my name. I'm like, okay, well, let's read your paper. So at the, <laughs> the last, I swear to God, this is, I, I, I kid you not if I'm, you know, if I'm even deviating from the truth. So exaggerating. So the last sentence said, based on the evidence presented here, we do not recommend routine use of screws in spinal fusions. He looked at it. He looked at it again and he said, no, that's wrong. And he walked away. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> right. yeah. and, it, and, and it all, you know, and, and I had a hard time for about two, three years. I'm like, what is going on? Because you got to understand right now, instrument companies basically own and direct the whole spine surgery. And how do they do that? This is how they do it. A company comes up with a product. Then they uh, approach somebody always very famous. They don't go to somebody uh, in a small town. They go to somebody who's at, you know, Stanford, Johns Hopkins or something like that. And from that point on, that surgeon gets into their payroll. And unfortunately, I've never seen anybody says that, hey, this stuff doesn't work. So what happens, like they publish papers that are favorable to that product. Well, we start using it, and 10 years later, we find that stuff didn't work. Nobody says anything. Yeah. Everybody just goes to the next uh, product. And I'm like, no, wait a minute. Come back here. Uh, we got to answer some questions. Uh, what is this research you did that nobody can duplicate? Uh, you know, that's what's going on with Dr. Zedelik's research. Nobody can. All the papers as Bunsen said it doesn't work. And the CEO of that company that did that now is in the south of France, is retired and nobody can touch him. And wow. I, I don't think that's fair. I think uh, he should be responsible. Come back here. We got to ask you some questions. What mm -hmm. happened here? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so, so that's unfortunately at this time, the reason to write this book is that I tried my best. I went to American Academy of I talked to the doctors and it's just not getting through. So I had to make public aware of what's going on. The yeah. first thing that needs to be done, there are two things that needs to be done. First thing that needs to be done is to make the researchers, people at the, at the position of power, so-called leaders of the field, they need to understand that when they get hired as a consultant, they should not work as an undercover operative to advance their agenda. They have an oath. They have responsibility for the people. So yeah. they have to evaluate those devices, you know, uh, with a blind eye in a way or, 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 or you know, just, just going to be very fair, basically. Right, right. So we somehow got to cut the influence that the instrument companies have in the world of spine. Two, we have to change the training from the beginning. Yeah. Spine surgery was never meant to be a subspecialty of orthopedic surgery. And this is how I explain it. The principles that work in general orthopedic surgery is a completely different principles that spine surgery uh, acts with, you know, uh, mm. they, uh, operates with. And this is, for example, is this. It's like a Newtonian physics and quantum physics. Newtonian physics, if you want to build a house on Earth, you know, you use Newtonian physics and it works very well. But if you want to send, a, uh, build a laser or send a, a spacecraft to moon, you need to have other principles. We call it quantum physics. Right. And right. that's how it is. That's, that's how right. what the analogy is. When you go from orthopedic surgery to spine surgery, you got to unlearn which wow. is very difficult. I don't think it can right. be done. You got to unlearn what you learned in orthopedic surgery and then relearn everything in orthopedic surgery, basically. Mm. And that doesn't exist I right mean, now, correct? Surgery. No, yeah. <laughs> no. I, so no, hopefully I, some young, ambitious, really wants to make a change in the world MD <laughs> is listening right. to this and he's like, that's my sweet spot. <laughs> right. We have to do something, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's just, this is just a very dangerous place that I'm entering because, you know, my wife yeah. was 
very against this book. My wife. Is I like, get yeah, it. I was like, I hope he ha- is protected because seriously, <laughs> the, it takes a lot of courage yeah, to speak but- up about these kinds of things. And it's so funny, you know, because I was, I don't even know why I, I get on. I'm, I'm we're, we're, we're kindred souls. I, I speak up about stuff. I shouldn't say when it, when I feel that it could harm people and they should know. And I was just posting in my Instagram story today. I, I wasn't even thinking about the fact that we were coming on this episode later, but I was sharing that this um, article about authors of um, the premier medical textbook didn't disclose that $11 million in industry payments. It's Harrison's principles of internal medicine. It's in its 20th edition. It's considered a must read for medical students. And yeah, it's uh, between 2009 and 2013, they received more than $11 million from drug and medical device companies. And they did not disclose that to the readers. So these medical students, you know, and so this is happening in your field, it's happening in a lot of medicine and it's unbelievably unethical, unbelievably like beyond unethical, just wrong. Right. You know, you know, you know, now you got to understand. Sure. Absolutely. You got to understand I'm a researcher. So unfortunately, if yeah. the doctor has an idea, so so what I say is that the, the relationship between uh, uh, between the company and the doctor should be for because there's no other way. I mean, how are you going to do yeah. that? I mean, doctors yeah. got to work with companies, right? Yeah, how are you going to pay uh, for it? But but the problem is that at some point you have to tell, tell somehow people. you got to be some sort of an right. ethics in the right. doctors that you're not working for them. You're working for people. I mean, right. I, I just don't know how to do that. I just don't know. Yeah. You know, unfortunate, unfortunate thing about money is that they'll corrupt you. The more money you make, yeah. the more money you want. And it never ends. It's just, yeah. it keeps going. <laughs> yeah. Until you're in the South of France, like whatever, you can't sleep at night. <laughs> right, right. But I appreciate you letting the people know, you know, you're letting the people know, like, here's where it's at. Here's the truth. You're kind of a whistleblower <laughs> for sure. Right. And I appreciate right. it. Sharing right. and just sharing what you've learned from the inside. So people just have more information to consider. So that way, if they're like, you know what? I guess I want to take a chance with these screws. At least they know, at least they may know like, Hey, but also here, you know, because what they're probably being told is, yep, this is the way you do it. And that's it. (laughs) You you want, you want to know something even worse. Let me explain to you something because I see it all the time. Mm -hmm. I've been going, I I finished my um, uh, training in 2002. So that's 20 years ago. I go to conferences at least twice a year and I hear the same thing over and over and over and this is how it goes every time i go to a conference somebody gets up every time there's a talk about these screws they say there's plenty of evidence that says these screws work beautifully so six months later somebody else gets. there's plenty of evidence that says these screws work beautifully so i remember in 2018 i got up and I heard the same thing. The guy up front said, there's plenty of evidence that says pedicle screws work beautifully. And I said, it does not exist. Stop saying that. Wow. Stop. So what has happened is that somebody in like 1990s or so got up in these lectures and said, oh, there's a plenty of evidence and wow. referring to whatever. And then <laughs> this thing just got a, a regurgitated. Its own. Exactly. Yeah. To yeah. a point, listen, this is so bad. To a point that if you ask, I had a couple of conversations with the young guys. I told them, I said, you know, the papers that we have says the screws don't work. They would not accept me. They would not wow. believe me. They would say, that's not true. We showed long time ago that these screws work beautifully. Wow. I'm like, we never did. Wow. There's so, so much confirmation bias. And you're right. It's the unlearning. It's kind of like, you know, in, in my nutrition field, it's like going when eggs were bad forever. I'm still dealing with that. People still think red meat is bad for them. People still think, you know, it's just these very general. I was just going to make a post about potatoes. I'm like, when did potatoes get demonized? Like they're growing the ground. They're full of vitamins, minerals, fibers, the right. complete proteins. Like, but these things, like once they're ingrained in a system, it's like, oh, potatoes bad. I shouldn't eat those or eggs bad. I shouldn't eat those, you know, and it's just these belief systems that don't get questioned and you're questioning those belief systems and asking people to, Hey, back it up. 
and look into right. look look into it a little more and have some morals. <laughs> right, care, right, right. care. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. But yeah. but one thing I really need people to understand is that I'm not a whistleblower. I'm a researcher. Why? Yeah. Because if I truly am a whistleblower, that means there is something malicious going on that everybody knows about it. And that means yeah. some people have to go to jail. Yeah. But but that's not the situation. Here. Right. The right. situation here is that I stumbled upon these things because I was developing the other device. And because I stumbled through these things, I realized that it's the training yeah. that's wrong yeah. from the beginning. It's the training. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's somehow uh, right now, World of Spine Surgery is run as a cult. I mean, somehow they believe that these, I swear to God, it's like a cult. Like yeah. we know we somehow, for some reason, we are absolutely know that these screws work and no other thing. Well, where is the, you know, and, and let me explain to you something too. It's very simple to see why the screws don't work. I'll explain it to you. Let's say in the upright human, Okay, how do we put these screws in? The screws go in, let's say, parallel to the ground, right? So they, if I'm, I'm talking this uh, for people who, you know, they don't yeah. see the visual thing, so they can uh, kind yeah. of create in their mind. So let's say a patient uh, stands upright. So the screws get inserted parallel to the ground. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, what is the motion of the vertebrae that these screws trying to stop? After all, The purpose of the screws is to stop emotion from happening. Mm -hmm. Well, the way that the vertebrae works, it doesn't, vertebrae doesn't slide back and forth. It doesn't jump up and down. It rotates. Mm. It rotates. So it's a rotational motion. And the axis of that rotation is right through the middle of that disc. Mm. That's the motion. We know that motion because we try to duplicate it with Mm. disc replacement. So sometimes... I approached the surgeon. I said, we know, you know, everybody knows what the motion is. Well, so how hard is it to understand that it's the same motion the screws are trying to stop? I I, I don't know how hard that concept is. Well, guess what? If the motion that they're trying to stop is a rotational, that means the screws, if they fail, they fail in toggle, Mm -hmm. not pull out. Mm -hmm. Well, Screw is not a device that is made for toggle. I was six years old. I was, I remember even the moment I was six years old when I realized if I want to take a screw out, I don't yank on it. I toggle it, it will come out. Right. So, so every time we test these screws, we (laughs) test it for pull out. Every time, like I looked at the whole literature. Mm. And every time we test it, we make it, we try to make it better. We try to make it better in a pullout. Uh, everything we tested, we tested wow. in a pullout. But <laughs> in the humans, yeah. in the patient's body, it has to stop toggle. Wow. So actually, the screw fails in the, in the 90 degree plane off to the plane that actually we tested. So this is what I tell the doctor. I said, You tell the screw, do something that it's not made for. You give him nothing but spongy bone. And when the papers come out and say it doesn't work, you don't want to believe it. I I, I just, I don't know what else to say. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, you're just calling it like calling straight shots. And I appreciate you doing it. I have to ask you before we wrap up, have you ventured? Have you taken it? Because I, I so appreciate that you have the, um, uh, lack of ego need to be right to be able to talk to chiropractors. So like be open-minded. How can we come together? How can we share? Oh my gosh, it's such a relief. I'm, I love my chiropractor. I mean, I like drive away, like, please bless him with everything that he needs in his life. Thank you so much. Oh my gosh. I feel so good. You know, I mean, like I've been really helped because probably any little issue I'm having from the gym is just, it's, I'm at that stage that you talked about that first stage. I can be adjusted, you know, and my massage therapist in his office and stuff. So I appreciate you had that open-mindedness. I'm curious if you've taken a deep dive into regenerative medicine at all. 
you know, I haven't got there. I'm so involved with this. Yeah. <laughs> I would, I'm like, I got to yeah. introduce you to some of these regenerative right. docs. I would love to see you guys in a combo right. together. <laughs> my wife is totally, my wife is totally into that, actually. Okay. My wife, you know, she has yeah. a regenerative doctor that she's working in right okay. now, as a matter of fact. But, yeah. but this is, this is my take, though. You got to understand that a disease process, it's not just on or off. It's not yeah. black and white. It's right. a whole spectrum, you know, yeah. of things. Yeah. So when the right. surgery comes in, we're at the end spectrum yeah. of the problem. Right. The chiropractor right. is a little bit toward the end. In that beginning part and the regenerative stuff. Right. You know, so so we all working, I mean, we all working toward the same goal, but yeah. we work in different spectrum Stages. of the same yeah. problem. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and that's what, you know, and, and unfortunately, I, you know, let me tell you, when I started this research and development, somebody told me something that really stuck with me. He said, you're going to have a big problem. I'm like, what? He goes, spine surgeon's attitude is that if this is something that I did not invent, it must be junk. Yeah. Yeah. I actually, when I was in college, I worked for a neurosurgeon as a receptionist and I got real introduced to the ego side of things. I was like, okay. But see, but the problem is that because that's what they train you in residency. That's the problem. They, that's, you know, I, I was talking about that to my wife the other day. I said, you know what? They train you to be a, it's a brutal, brutal training. You want to hear a story how brutal it is? Just say it quickly, just to tell you how brutal yeah. it is. One of my colleagues in general surgery, um, his brother was getting married in four months. Four months from now, let's say your brother, the only brother is getting married in Florida. And I was in the program in California. And um, and the schedule has already come out because the schedule for the on-call was coming six months at a time. So six months and then six months and then six months. So, you know, so the schedule had been already out and he was uh, supposed to be on call that weekend. But five people, five people came forward to the chairman. They said, let him go. We will take care of that. We will, we will take two people will take call, you know, you know, let him go. Mm-hmm. The chairman said, no, he stays and he takes that call. <laughs> why? I mean, why? why? Yeah. I, I just, I just, you know, why? So what happens in these residencies is that they make you an amazing surgeon. They make you a great surgeon that you're not going to make any mistakes and all that stuff. But they take that humanity out of you. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I can see that. Yeah. I mean, I yeah. real quick, a story of my own. I remember when, when I was working at that neurosurgeon's office, you know, I'm like 19 years old, little receptionist summer job. And I, there was a time that there was, um, I mean, people had long waits to get into this guy long months mm-hmm. long would drive from out of state. And I remember one time he was golfing. He was on a long, long lunch golf. It was a golf lunch date with mother docs. And he, we got the call that he was going to be later and to cancel his next few appointments. Right. So these mm-hmm. people are already sitting in the office and I had to tell this woman and her husband, I can see him. He's in so much pain. And I'm like, I'm sorry, he's going to have to reschedule. And she just broke down crying and begging. And she was like, he is in so much pain. We had to wait three months for this appointment. Like he doesn't even want to be alive anymore. And she's just bawling, begging. And I'm like, oh my gosh, well, I'm relaying it. And he's like, sorry, they're going to have to reschedule. And I, I mean, yeah. I literally, I couldn't even sleep that night. I was so sick to my stomach and that stuff happens. You know, there isn't always ways, you know, and I'm not saying you're not trying to pick on docs, but like there is an energy sometimes. And it's, of course it's a choice, right? Like you choose to show up the way you do and other people choose to show up the way they do, (laughs) but it's, there isn't always this lack, this level of like, I really want to help you. (laughs) I really want to help. And I appreciate that. that. You know, unfortunately that sometimes happens when the doc is so busy, you know, I mean, I mean, I don't know. Right. There's so many doctors that have so many different expectations of life, work yeah. ethics, right. personality. Right. So I cannot say about that, uh, you know, but I tell you, you know, one of the reasons that I stumbled to this thing 
is because I'm open-minded because I yeah. always, yeah. As, a, and you, as a scientist, you have to be, as a scientist, yes. you have to say, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe Just I'm wrong. Maybe, yes. Maybe I'm wrong, you know, because yes. in this case, in this case, the ego, our ego has pushed us mm-hmm. and the, the car, the path of destruction that we have carved yeah. in the society it's unimaginable what we've done for the last so true. three decades to our patients. Wow. It's just crazy. Yeah, I mean, when you, if you think about it. When you're right and you know everything, you can't learn. You can't right. grow. You can't improve. You just see up and, you, and you're exactly right. It's like that cult-like mentality of just like, we're going to just go off this cliff together because we're right. 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 <laughs> this exactly. is the right way to go right towards this cliff. Keep going. Yep. 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 Nobody question right. it. <laughs> right. Right. All right. Wow. Well, we'll wrap it up here, guys. The name of the book is Corporate Spine, How Spine Surgery Went Off Track and How We Put It Right. I thank you for doing this. And- and I gotta explain that you know I didn't want to write a book to just be a you know complain just kind of a yeah. you know contra- yeah. so the first four chapters the first four chapters I wanted to teach patients what mm. we do as spine surgeons um, so it's not just all about controversy so it's yeah. very in terms of you know because as spine surgeons we haven't really teach our patients yeah. what we have to deal with yeah. uh, what you know what we can do what we cannot do so they could understand well That's for cool. example you know for example do i have some time do i have like yeah. two minutes yeah. okay so for example you know, everybody wants to go to a doctor, have one surgery and get fixed. I mean, that's, everybody yeah. wants that. Right. You know? Well, unfortunately, uh, that's sometimes possible, sometimes it's not. And I explain that in the book. I divide my patients into two categories, simple and complex. Mm-hmm. Simple if they have one or two discs that are bad. Complex if they have three or more. Why? Because when you transition from simple to complex, the problem goes from a localized problem into a regional problem. Mm. So if you have a localized problem, like one or two discs, the surgery does great. You fix the patient, you fuse the patient. It doesn't affect the biomechanics overall. They can have a good life actually after that and patients do well. But when you have three or more, we're not talking about this one surgery anymore. We're talking about managing the patient throughout okay. the year. And as a matter of fact, the concept of staged procedure is not a bad concept that, oh, you had another surgery, oh, you didn't get a No, in this mm-hmm. situation, we have to manage the patient in steps. Why? Because if you do one big surgery and there's a problem, then you can't figure out what the problem is. Now the patient is committed for life of you know pain management. But yeah. if you break it up into smaller surgeries, and if there's a problem, there's a much better chance that you can figure it out and you can solve that problem. Mm-hmm. So that's something that the patients need to understand. And yeah. that's yeah. And, and another thing is that uh, so I always encourage my patients to come in with their significant other, because once the significant other sees the MRIs, they realize what's yeah. going on. Because neck and back pain will wreck marriages, will wreck yeah. you know your life basically. I mean, yeah. all day, all day, I see patients that are about to lose their house, lose their yeah. uh, car. You yeah. know, they they had a great life. Now they are injured. Now they can't Talks. work. Now, I mean, yeah. everything just in a in a in a blink of an eye just turned wow. upside down. Mm. So, so I want my patients significant other to be there to look at those MRIs so they can realize that yeah. hey you know this is this is what's going this on for real because people yeah. with the back pain they're not sick they don't look sick they don't right. they don't right so you right. tell them like hey what's going on and they don't want to do this and they don't want to do that and they're like what's wrong with you and meanwhile right. they got a knife stuck in their back <laughs> right right yeah that's right. great so there's a huge education component in terms of what to know if you're having back issues and then also Correct. talking about why some of these procedures might be something to question and and other resources for having a more successful outcome correct for example you know we know this is a known fact in the world of spine surgery that in our world, looks don't matter. You can have two discs next to each other. One of them looks horrible. The other one, barely something there. Mm. And it turns out that the look, disc that was horrible wasn't the problem. Mm. The one next to it was the I tell you a story. I, uh, about uh, eight years ago, I had a patient that was a nurse at the hospital 
Uh, she had a bad disc between C5 and C6 in her neck. You know, I'll just be short. So I had this casual, not casual attitude. Where I said, oh, yeah, no problem. I'll fix you. Yeah. Well, I did the surgery. She didn't get better. So I was like, oh, uh, what do I do now? Uh, so I sent her myself to three other doctors, all three doctors, surgeons. My friend said, uh, you know, Dr. Asley did the right surgery. There's no, sorry, we're, you're stuck with this. So after a year, I told her, I said, there's another disc below it that doesn't look bad at all, but it could be the problem. But I cannot talk about another surgery because God forbid, if you're not better with this, now you've had two surgeries, you still have the neck pain. I won't forgive myself. But that's a decision that you need to make. So she came back and said, I can't live like this. I'm going to take my chances. Mm -hmm. We did the surgery on the lower disc that wasn't as bad, and all the pain went away. Wow. So so patient needs to understand that because we tend to do surgery on a disc that's, that looks the worst. And most of the time, it is the problem. But sometimes when it's that, they just, unfortunately, that's what we deal with. We just yeah. don't have a way. We yeah. don't have a test to tell us where the pain is coming from. Yeah, I love that. It's a uh, when you're not in a, a health field or a certain medical, field, you you think that like we know everything. <laughs> it's like surprise, like we are still learning, or we would just right. be able to like make bodies out of thin air. <laughs> right. Still learning. So right, yeah, right. I appreciate appreciate the education component, like just across right. the board on this book. We'll link it up right. um, in the show notes, and then link people. To, do you have a website? I'm sorry, I should have pulled that up. Um, that, where people can find you or. Well, I, my website is my office website, which okay. is uh, uh, which is uh, spine treatment center. Yes. Dot com. Yes. But okay. but for the book, I've prepared a website that I'm going to okay. upload in like in the next uh, week or so. I'm going to okay. upload some videos for every chapter. So if somebody nice. read the chapter, didn't understand or they don't want to read the book, they don't have time. They can go watch the videos for every chapter. Nice. Uh, and. And that uh, um, that website is corporatespinebook.com, corporatespinebook.com. Awesome. So maybe that will be up by the time this comes out. So we'll link that up as well. And then it, you also have a cool. YouTube channel, I notice, and you're teaching about some of these things on there. So we'll link that as well. And sure. yeah, I just appreciate you so much. Thanks for showing up thank to the you. play. And thank you for coming and sharing with us today. Thank you very much for giving me the chance to talk about this. 